What's up, YouTube? This is Two Raw Four TV. All right, so I want to go ahead and continue with this top fifteen centers list, and um, just to do a brief recap. At number 15, I have Nikola Jokic. At number 14, I had the Chief, Robert Parrish. At number 13, I had uh, Bob McAdoo. At number 12 on the list, uh, Wes Unsell. Number 11, Nate the Great Thurman. At number 10, Patrick Ewing. And at number 9, the A-Train artist, Gilmore. At number 8, I have George Mikan. All right? Uh, George Mikan, uh, in my opinion, all right, it's just my opinion, he is the second most dominant center in the history of the game. Now, I know people throw out Shaq, but when you look at how dominant George Mikan was in his era, uh, I think he only falls second to Chamberlain as far as sheer dominance as far as how much he dominated the game. You know, when the Minneapolis Lakers played other teams, they didn't say the Lakers versus the Knicks or the Lakers versus the Celtics. The marquee would say George Mikan versus the Knicks, George Mikan versus the Celtics. And that was because he was the true truly the first superstar to play in the NBA. He wasn't the first star. That was probably Joe Fulks, but the first superstar was George Mikan. He was nicknamed Mr. Basketball. And uh, for his era, he was a giant. 6'10", 245 pounds. Uh, there was nothing like him. You know, what's interesting, though, is that before the rise of George Mikan, there was a prevailing belief in basketball that big men would not be good at the sport. They were thought to be too clumsy, too slow, not very well coordinated. That's why if you look at any of those old, old pre-NBA uh, you know, uh, pro leagues, uh, you know, there were a lot of different small-time pro basketball leagues, uh, regional leagues. But if you look at some of those leagues from the 20s and 30s, you'll notice that the centers are usually under 6'4", under 6'5", right? And I think sometimes young people misconstrue that era with Wilts or even Mikans. Like, they, they look at these old photos and just – because they have no concept of the time period, they look at players from the 20s and 30s and just say, hey, oh, those guys play with Wilt, who wasn't even born yet. Um, but yeah, anyway, that was what the prevailing belief was. But Ray Meyer, who was George Mikan's uh, coach, I want to say, I want to say, um, I'm a little bit rusty with Mikan, but I want to say, Ray Meyer also was his coach in high school. But I know he was his coach in DePaul. And Ray Meyer uh, believed that the big man could be dominant. He had a theory that a big man would dominate basketball because of his size. And he saw in George Mikan some potential. But the problem was Mikan was not a natural athlete. Um, you know, he wasn't. He he was not the most coordinated. He wasn't especially fast. He wasn't really athletic. So he had to work hard to improve his coordination. Um, I think some of the things he did was, uh, as far as improving his stamina, included uh, jumping rope, um, uh, you know, walking with his shoes tied to, to, to get, you know, to improve his, uh, you know, his balance. Uh, he even had George Mikan take dancing lessons to improve his grace and, and, and footwork and things of that nature. And he worked relentlessly 
on uh, post moves. And, and I'm talking about when he was in college. He worked relentlessly on this game to the point where uh, he perfected at the time what was at the time the best hook shot in the game. And, um, you know, working on his layups and working on things of that nature, you may know now that these things are called the Mikan drill. But um, George Mikan vastly improved as a player to the point where he was the most dominant player in college. And uh, due to Mikan, college implemented a... Uh, a defensive goaltending rule to slow down a Mike. And then the NBA, when Mike became a pro, did the same thing to slow him down. They uh, instituted goaltending in the early 1950s because Mike was so damn dominant. Um, another thing they did because of Mike, they widened the foul lane because Mike was just too. Dominant. He was just clogging up the middle, and players just could not, smaller players uh, just could not get off. He was blocking everything. And, and you know, and, and because of the smaller lanes, you know, he just was taking up too much space. And he was able to, you know, challenge everything. He was affecting the game too much to the point where. They had to widen the foul lanes. And then finally, before the 54-55 season, they instituted the shot clock, which was probably the biggest thing that they implemented in, in the NBA, in the history of the NBA. <coughs> um, before that, teams would try to play takeaway. Uh, 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 not takeaway, excuse me. Teams would try to play uh, keep away from Mike and, um because before there was no shot clock, you could just hold the ball. And there was an extreme version of this one particular game. I believe it was, the, I, I believe the Lakers were playing the Fort Wayne Pistons at the time, who were now the Detroit Pistons. And the Lakers were able to win that game 19-18 to because the Pistons just were holding the ball. But this made for ugly basketball. And so, ultimately, the shot clock was created so that, uh, implemented so that a team had 24 seconds to shoot the ball or you would lose possession. Um, just to give you an idea about how dominant Mikan was, um, he won three NBA scoring titles, and I believe he won an NBL scoring title, but I know he won three scoring titles in the NBA. His highest scoring average, I think, was the 50-51 season when he averaged 28.4 points per game. Now, to give you an persp- idea of what I'm talking about, proportion and pace and all of that, right? Now, I'm not saying that Mikan would replicate that today because I do believe that Mikan, unlike Karl Malone, I think he would have issues with stamina playing today. Uh, but, theoretically... The Lakers that year averaged 82.8 points per game. Which means that Mike was responsible for over 34% of his team's total offense that year. Proportionally, if you take the NBA league average today, that would be a guy averaging 39 points per game in today's league. Like I said, I don't think Mike would be able to do that because I don't think he I don't think he would be able to play the pace of today's game. But um he definitely dominated the game that he was a, a member of uh, and, and you know and and he played in a far different era man like back then you could, it was a such thing as balling um you could double hand check uh you could Routinely, guys got beat up in games. Guys had broken noses, fractured jaws, uh, teeth knocked out, uh, broken ribs. This was a different version of basketball. 
<clears throat> this was foot basketball. Literally. It, it was even more physical than the 60s and 70s and much more so than the 80s, which we look at as physical, but <clears throat> the 50s was a different type of basketball. And because of these things, and because, let's be honest, you know, as much as I love to big up these players, it was an inferior game. They, you know, they, they didn't have the shooting touch the players, of course, have today, the shooting skills, the ball handling ability, you know, uh, shooting ranges were somewhat limited, you know, probably up to maybe 17, 18 feet. They didn't have quite the same <laughs> skill set the players that they have. So that was part of the reasons why field goal percentages were so low. Uh, but Mike and for his career averaged 23 points and 14 rebounds. Unlike Shaq, he led the league in rebounding at least one year. Uh, probably would have led the league in blocks had blocks been counted, something Shaq never did. And um, But Mike and was the leader of one of the great dynasties. It was the first dynasty in the history of the NBA. <clears throat> they won five championships, including three consecutive. In fact, they're only, they were only one of four teams to win at least three championships in a row. The others being, of course, Bill Russell's Boston Celtics, Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls, and Shaq and Kobe's Lakers. Uh, <clears throat> Mikan was a great scorer as far as in the post for his era. Uh, he, he was pretty much unstoppable. Uh, his career high was 61 points. Uh, he was a great rebounder and shot blocker. And basically, because in his era, nobody was really quite his size. I think the other tallest players may have been 6'9", 6'8", but they were like maybe 215. So he had this distinct size advantage and strength advantage. So he routinely shot over smaller defenders. Usually, using his hook shot, which he could shoot with either hand. And, um, you know, he was, for his era, uh, efficient. For his era. You know, when you look at the 40% figure percentage now, it looks low. But for his era, that was about average. If not even above average. <clears throat> he also... Shot free throws underhanded. <laughs> so I said, so I would say from, uh, you know, when you look at the way he played basketball, shooting granny free throws with the glasses looking like Clark Kent, you know, he doesn't quite fit into today's game. You know what I'm saying? Obviously. But he was a great foul shooter for a big man. He shot over 78% from the free throw line and had some seasons shooting over 80%. So... You know, that's something that you don't routinely see in a lot of big men. Uh, what else do I want to say about Mike? And, uh, because of the nature of the game and because of the fact that, of course, training regimens and diet and all those types of things, surgeries were so primitive compared to today, players back then didn't play nearly as long as they do today. Um, Mike began to show signs of decay <clears throat> at age as young as age 29 and by age 31 he was pretty much done and you know when the shot clock was implemented because of the, the fact that the pace of the game had sped up and it was more of an up and down game unlike Carl Malone who had incredible stamina George Mike by that point was suffering he, he couldn't really prosper in that style. And, and his dominance began to decay, and he soon retired soon afterwards. Um, just to go through his resume right quick, George Mikan uh, played for the Chicago American Gears and the Minneapolis Lakers. He briefly coached the Lakers one season. 1957-58, and uh, I believe one of the reasons why he gave up coaching the team was because he had no interest in moving uh, to L.A. 
because of course the team would famously relocate to Los Angeles. But he was a five-time BAA NBA champion, two-time NBL champion, the NBL most valuable player in 1948, four-time NBA All-Star, the NBA All-Star Game MVP, a six-time All-BAA slash NBA first teamer, two-time All-NBL first team, NBL scoring champion in 1948. Three-time NBA scoring champion, 1949 to 51. NBA rebounding leader back in 1953. Back in those days, uh, rebounding champions were determined by the total amount of rebounds and not rebounds per game. He was voted the greatest player of the first half of the 20th century back in 1950. He's on the 25th, 35th, and 50th anniversary teams as well as the 75th. His number 99 retired by the Lakers just this past year, October. I think it was October the 30th. And I made numerous videos advocating this guy's number should be retired. Should have been retired decades ago. But, uh, you know, finally it happened. George Mikan, after his playing career, attempted to go into politics. Uh, he ran for Congress, I think in 1957 it was. But uh, ultimately he was unsuccessful. No, 1956, excuse me. He ran for Congress in 1956, was unsuccessful. Uh, Mikan, I think, went private. Uh, I think he went into private practice as a lawyer I believe it was and uh, or I, th I think he worked in law and uh, but anyway the things I'm sure of is he was the first commissioner in the ABA alright he was the first commissioner of the ABA it was his idea to come up with the red white and blue ABA ball and um he helped to implement the Institute the Three Point Line, which they actually adapted from another league in the early 1960s that uh, created Three Point Line. Uh, in the mid 1980s, George Mikan uh, headed a task force, which helped to ultimately bring basketball back to Minnesota with the Minnesota Timberwolves. Uh, unfortunately, in his later years. George Mikan suffered from various health problems, including uh, failing kidneys and diabetes. And um, as a matter of fact, in his very last years, he had to have, because of circulation issues, he had to have uh, his leg amputated just below the knee. And... Um, you know, it, it was bad. I think he only had a pension of like fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars a month. And when you have medical expenses like that, when you consider this is George Mike and what he did as far as helping to elevate the NBA to what it was, with these guys making all this money, you know, it, it still to this day pisses me off. You know, uh. George Mikan died broke 18 days before his 81st birthday back in 2005, I believe it was, shortly before the NBA Finals started, I think. Shaquille O'Neal helped to pay for, uh, I'm trying to remember whether it was 2006 he passed away or 2005. I think it was 2005. But anyway, <clears throat> George Mikan uh, passed away, I think it was 2005. And uh, it was Shaquille O'Neal who helped to pay for his funeral. Of course, now, since then, the NBA uh, pays a lot more money for uh, players who were retired before 1965. I believe they have access to free health care now. And these are some things that uh, are long overdue. But uh, George Mike, one of the 10 greatest players, in my opinion, in the history of the NBA. Uh, tell me what you guys think.